everybody. I'm Jayatri Das, Chief Bioscientist here at the Franklin Institute. And welcome to the first episode of a new program that we're calling Ben's Roundtable. So I'm excited to be joined today by my friends and colleagues here. Uh, Derek Pitts, Chief Astronomer, Daryl Williams, uh, our Senior VP for Science and Education and an engineer by training, and Rachel Valletta, our Environmental Scientist. And we're here because we're, we like to think that we're channeling the spirit of Ben Franklin with these programs. So Ben Franklin and his friends would get together every Friday night and you know just chat about the, the newest questions and discoveries around science, technology, ethics, civics. Um, and you know that's still the same today. Every day there are new discoveries and new applications of science and technology. And we want to talk with you and with each other about what we think they mean for our world. So each month, we're going to come together to talk about stories that have piqued our interest. Um, we'll go around, you know, giving each person a few minutes to talk about a story that's, you know, kind of caught our attention this month. Um, but we'd love to hear from you about what questions are capturing your curiosity as well. Um, and, you know, we'll try and work those into the rotation of stories that we talk about. So. All right, let's talk about how this is gonna work. All right, I'm keeping time. So we're gonna go around uh, the screen here and I'll call on each of you um, to start us off with just a quick like one minute, 90 second overview of the story that you're gonna share. And then we'll have lots of questions, send us your questions um, and then we'll move on to the next topic. So we'll you know keep this fast and furious, just kind of uh, getting into the spirit of being, you know, asking questions and thinking about new ideas. All right, so Derek, you are up first and you're trying to talk about this idea of internet from space. What's that all about? Yeah, thanks a lot. This is a really interesting piece of space technology that has piqued my interest recently. You know, the SpaceX company that we've all come to know over the last couple of years uh, is, embarking on a new technology to help bring internet to people all across the world. Here the idea is that Elon Musk, the CEO of the company, wants to provide low cost broadband access for people all over the world. Now to do that, rather than use cell phone towers, he's actually put in a system that we now call a constellation of satellites. There are 1600 in orbit already that have started this program providing access to the internet around the world, but he wants to add quite a bit more of these. In fact, he's applied for a license from the FCC to put up 42,000 of these. Now just think, this would provide internet access all over the world at a low cost, so it sort of democratizes access to the internet. But here's the catch. One catch is astronomers are a little disturbed about this. And the reason why is because these satellites are very reflective and astronomers taking long exposure photographs of the night sky to discover new objects way out in space are beginning to see these satellites showing up in their in images. So right now there are just 1600, but imagine if there were 42,000 of these satellites, what that might do for research astronomy in a not so good way. And then the other thing we might be concerned about with this is, do we really need 42,000 additional satellites? But wait, we're providing internet access for folks all over the world. There's a bit of interesting news about space technology to chew on for a minute. Whoa, that is a, a trade-off. <laughs> <laughs> Derek, can you help us put the 42,000 into context? I mean, are there already tens of thousands of satellites or are we talking only hundreds that exist up there now? Oh, that's a really good question. You know, the way this is broken down, we think of it as there are something like 20,000 uh, easily detectable, radar detectable objects, but there are really many, many, many smaller pieces of space junk around. In fact, it's gotten to the point where many technologists are very concerned about the incredible amount of quote unquote space junk that's up there because it could come to a point where that's going to make it difficult for us to have access to space altogether just because there's so much junk in the way. So if we're adding more, you might think that's a good thing because of what we're providing for everybody else around the world. But on the other hand, maybe it's not so good. Hmm. 
I'm also so, thinking too, just, I'm oh, sorry, just jump in real quick. I just, I'm curious too about space travel in general, right? You have more objects in orbit. That's more things you have to dodge and navigate. So what does that look like for um, the equivalent of, of air traffic controllers who are helping to? <laughs> right. It's the bob and weave, Daryl. <laughs> and you know what? And guess what, Rachel? You're not far off because NASA already does this with International Space Station. You know, International Space Station is the size of a football field. And believe it or not, there have been occasions when NASA has had to move International Space Station because they've been concerned about a piece of space junk coming too close to Space Station in its travel. Mm. Now, think about it. This, uh, these objects travel at 17,000 miles per hour. So even something yeah. the size of a ping pong ball can do extraordinary damage. So, you know, what do we do here? More so internet Derek, access or clean up space? I'm curious about like who makes this decision, right? It's not like we can go to like city council, right? Like who owns, who owns space? <laughs> Well, that's an interesting problem. Nobody owns space. We've all agreed that we're gonna treat space in a certain way, but when that system was being set up in the late 50s and early 1960s, there was one thing that was overlooked. And that is that we didn't really tag any of these spacefaring countries or anybody that puts satellites up. We didn't tag them with a responsibility to deorbit the satellites once their life, is, their life period is over with. So there are lots of quote unquote, dead satellites in orbit that are simply defunct, not working, broken, ran out of fuel, all these sorts of things. And many of them are high enough in an orbit that they'll hang there for hundreds of years. So we need to start thinking about tagging everybody who uses space with the responsibility to deorbit their junk when they're done with it. <laughs> we had a question come through in the chat, and it's one that actually I was I was going to pose myself, but thanks to the audience for sharing it. Can the satellites have different lighting or shape or something that would differentiate them? And I'm thinking in my mind, we do all kinds of image adjustment anyway when we're doing space observation. We do it here with satellites watching Earth in the reverse. I mean, can we can we sort of do the same thing so that we take an image incorporating these and sort of subsequently subtract them out? <laughs> That's a great question. And in fact, there are, we're coming at this problem from two ends. One end is that astronomers are trying to figure out how they might be able to digitally subtract those objects from the images. So as you know, astronomy has become far more digital than it ever had been in the past. It's all going in that direction. So the digital aspect allows that kind of thing to happen if we know when and where these satellites are gonna show up. So on the astronomy side, there's some work happening. But over on the SpaceX side, the manufacturer side, SpaceX is even trying to figure out how they might be able to paint the satellites in such a way that they are far less reflective. And in fact, the CEO has said, this is not going to cause a problem for astronomy, wink, wink. But the other thing he has said is that if it does, we'll do everything we can to mitigate that issue. So it's still left to be seen how this is going to turn out in the future, but I think astronomers have a reason to be concerned, given that the kinds of astronomy coming up in the future are going to be images taken of wide swaths of the night sky in high resolution on a very, very high speed basis, and collecting the whole sky like that, images of the whole sky may show up more and more of these satellites. Eric, I want to ask one other question from the audience here too, because I because it, it was a question on my mind too, with all of these 40, you know, 42,000 satellites. We talked about you know physically potentially bumping into each other, but what about their signals? Do they interfere with each other? And well, with other a, satellites that are up there? Yeah, that's a great question. And 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 you're right, you would think that might happen. But you know, as it turns out, the frequencies for radio communication can be extraordinarily discrete especially digitally, you know, we can digitally select a frequency, a very, very narrow band, and we can filter it really well and protect it against other frequencies. So what the FCC does is they assign channels for certain kinds of communications, and everybody has to abide by that, because if they don't, not only might they tread on somebody else's signal, but their signal might also be lost. So it really behooves everybody to behave properly in terms of radio traffic. Now, if we could right. get them to behave in terms of satellites colliding with each other, that would be great. 
<laughs> All right, we're going to close up this segment with everyone's hot take here. <laughs> Daryl, what's, what's your takeaway? <laughs> Well, I just think I find it interesting, right, as we think about issues related to accessibility of, um, you know, internet access, and this has been a topic that's been front of mind for a long time now, and as the technology continues to advance, that also means that there's more opportunities for, for, for um, you know, improving the human experience, but definitely it sounds like this is a, a huge problem with some constraints that need to be taken into consideration, but ultimately I think the info really should be about making sure that we provide access, you know, equitable access uh, around the world. Rachel, what do you think? Well, I'll uplift what Daryl said. We're always talking and thinking about equity. I, I think it's a, it's a, it was one of these sticky conversations we need to delve into. Um, but I guess you know some of these huge problems often result historically in huge technological advancements. So I'm really excited. We heard from, from the audience, maybe there'll be an autonomous um, LEO junk cleanup robots. Maybe there'll be some sort of <laughs> robotic that. advancements or maybe some sort of invisibility cloak. I don't know, that's my, that's my hope here um, to see what comes out of, of trying, to make, uh, trying to make this work for everybody. Yeah, and I think for, for me, you know, what, what you said, you know, Philadelphia is one of the biggest cities in America with the lowest um, percent of people who have access to broadband. So this is an issue that affects us right here at home. Um, and my question is like, what are the alternatives? You know, is mm. it, you know, it can't be 42,000 satellites or nothing, right? What are, the, what are the other options that we have to solve this problem? Derek, last word. I think what this does is, uh, as, as everybody has pointed out, this shows us that there's a need to develop uh, new technologies for lots of different reasons. We need to clean up space. We need to provide the internet access equitably. Uh, and we can do these things. It's not a question of either or, it's always a question of and. And just if we have the will yeah. to do these things and recognize that we all, we all own space, it belongs to all of us. And we all need to give that uh, access to the internet Maybe we can get something done properly and save the night sky for astronomers too at the same time. All right, thank you. Okay, next one. We are done with internet from space. Daryl, you're gonna take us into a new perspective on face masks. So yeah, go ahead tell us sure. what it's all about. Absolutely. So, you know, a face mask wearing has become a way of life for many of us around the world. And so, you know, there's more than meets the eye. It's more than just putting something across your nose and mouth um, to obviously prevent uh, the, uh, and as a way to combat uh, the, the pandemic and, 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 uh, and the coronavirus. But I wanted to, I, I read uh, some articles that some scientists really sort of did some nitty gritty work to understand from a material science perspective, what's the difference between various types uh, of materials and their effectiveness against uh, uh, preventing um, exposure to, to, uh, to COVID. And so um, essentially, you know, if you think about uh, sort of natural fibers like cottons and wools, um, when you drill down and you use what's called a scanning electron microscope, which essentially by its very, by the, the term scanning, it literally scans by bombarding a particular material with, uh, with electrons. Those electrons then of course send a signal back that allows for us to study the topography and the composition of, of specific uh, substances and samples. And so some scientists at NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, as well as some scientists at Smithsonian, decided to do a deep dive to really sort of look at different uh, synthetic materials, natural fibers, and then a combination of those to see what's really the best morphology and design for, for constructing a face mask. And so it really just, it turns out that, um, and folks have heard the term N95, so these N95 masks, which I'm actually holding here, are really the best at uh, preventing um, the particulates or, uh, or the viruses from penetrating because they are both a combination of like with natural fibers like cotton and wool, the kinks and the twists and the turns. And so this allows for trapping the part of the particulates on, on the surfaces of those materials, as well as um, uh, trapping humidity and things of that nature, which adds another level or barrier against the, the penetration of these aerosols. And so if you're out there and you're, you're contemplating what type of face mask to get, your best option is gonna be a natural fiber, like a cotton or a wool, 
or one of these N95 masks, which is really designed at, at a multi at a multi layer level, which consists of both the uh, more uniform as well as these um, uh, sort of disorganized patterns that uh, prevent the, the particulates from coming through um, and from breathing or inhaling these into your into your body. So Daryl, can you talk a little bit of, uh, about how these face masks are made? Like, I think we know, you know, many of us are familiar with like how you make fabric, right? That there are fibers that you weave together. Um, but with these other types of masks, like how do they get made? So I'm actually gonna show, if I can share my screen, I'm gonna show so that, to help sort of yeah, answer take a look. this question. And if you take a look here, so this is an example of, and can you, can you see, um, oops, I didn't hit the share button. Uh -huh. That's important. <laughs> great, so let me know if you can see this. Okay, great. So this is a scanning electron microscope image of a KN95 mask. So as I was explaining here, you have these different layers that show, um, that allow, or rather, uh, uh, allow you to be able to breathe effectively, you know, just as you can uh, normally, but also uh, creating uh, some barriers of preventing the particulates from coming through. And so you see this, this sort of this layer by layer assembly uh, of uh, the various uh, material components here. This is the, this purple layer here, as they describe here, is the sandwich, is the filtration uh, layer, which traps is the most effective part of the KN95 mask that really traps the particulates. If I go back here to some other images, this is an image here of cotton flannel. So as I was describing before, this is the sort of these kinks in this, as I describe as a chaotic arrangement of the carbon uh, fibers that really allows for grabbing the particulates. Um, so you, 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 you think of it like, um, I'm trying to give like a good example. Well, if you, even if you look at like a cotton ball, right? You notice how cotton balls are really, um, they, they have a morphology and a design that's really um, very, uh, very chaotic. I guess I'll use the same word that they're using here in this description that um, because it's so chaotic, the particles don't have a clear path to enter um, our, our, our air passageways and for us to inhale. So that again is, is an effective uh, natural way for, um, our, for our protection against uh, the, the inhaling the particulates. This here is a polyester cotton blend. So we know polyester is synthetic as well. And here combined with cotton, which of course is a natural fiber. So we can see here the polyester here in blue, which is very organized arrangement versus this cotton here um, arrangement. And then lastly, this is an, another synthetic fabric rayon. Again, uh, the synthetic uh, um, materials are more organized in nature versus the, the wool and cotton fabrics, which have a tendency to be more or unorganized and, and chaotic in structure. And here again, we see here with this wool final. really cool i mean i'm really struck by you know just even though it's like the beauty of looking at, at these right. images jd I'm, I'm with you there the sem images are always so striking this is something i got to dabble in um uh, inspecting sediment samples and you wouldn't think dirt is so exciting until it gets under <laughs> a scanning electron microscope um but daryl you know i think what we're what we're hearing here and i just want to celebrate is that innate chaos built into sort of environmental materials and natural materials in this case could be a great, great benefit um, for all of us. Um, and, and I don't know, I, I just, I love thinking about, you know, activating uh, natural chaos. I think that's the, that's a phrase I'd like to take forth from this conversation. <laughs> right, right. And I think there's a question here too. Um, is there a difference between N95 and KN95? I actually honestly don't know what the K stands for for KN95. So I don't know if others on the panel have um, happened yeah, to know I, what I, the I K can, stands for. I can speak to that. Some of it is just different standards in different countries. Um, so the, uh, the KF94s, the KN95s, those tend to be um, regulated by Korean um, agencies. Um, and so there, there's, it's just a different supply chain coming through. 
Um, but there's also a question about what's the difference between a mask and a respirator. Again, this comes into different regulatory standards. So a respirator has to meet a certain level of filtration. So we talk about N95 respirators because they are tested um, to block 95% of um, aerosol particles above a certain size. Um, and so those are, you know, kind of technical definitions. Um, you know, when we're talking about, um, you know, protecting ourselves, you know, the one that's the most comfortable is the one that you should wear because you're most likely to wear it. <laughs> so, so I have a question for you, Daryl. You know, what, sure. the, what this suggests to me is that, you know, should I be caught without my mask someplace? If I'm going to improvise, maybe it's better for me to consider using my cotton undershirt with my my wool flannel shirt on top of that, as opposed to reaching for a rayon or a nylon piece of material someplace. You know, I'm thinking about those people that think that you know just a, a, a you know a bandana is enough. True, right. Again, yeah. So that also happens to, you know, if you happen to know what the actual material uh, composition is of the shirt that you're wearing. To be able to, I'm a pretty good guy, so I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I guess, you know. Heebie-jeebies here. <laughs> because like what we do know is that, you know, multiple layer, you know, is, are important. So, you know, what's, what's, I, 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 What's great, I think, is that most places have masks on hand. So if you don't have a mask, ask for one. Don't just use your shirt, please. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> don't use your shirt. Exactly. <laughs> All right, let's quick takeaways on this one. <laughs> Rachel, what do you take? What do you think? Well, I'll revisit my previous comment uh, just about celebrating um, built in natural chaos of environmental natural materials um, and and how we can sort of, you know, come upon existing existing stuff, right? Like existing natural materials um, and use them to our great benefit. I'm always um, amazed at, at how 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 diverse an array of materials exist. Uh, naturally this way and all of the innovative ways that humans have sort of stumbled upon uh, utilizing those materials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Derek, what's, what's your take? Uh, so I really love it that this kind of information is available for people so that they can understand the science of, of why this particular mask is important to wear. And I think the more information like this we can provide for people, the more sense it makes to them, the more logical it is for them to choose this this real way to do it over something else like your undershirt. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think for me, what's interesting about masks is this intersection of kind of science and design. Um, we also had a comment of, you know, that, you know, especially for folks who wear glasses, you know, wearing masks can be uncomfortable. And sometimes this, a solution can be as simple as just like taking a Band-Aid and sticking it, uh, you know, your, your mask in place to, to keep it. Um, and so, you know, we have this tech, you know, amazing technology, but it still comes down to understanding, you know, how people are built and how people use these items to figure out how to make them most effective. And Daryl, I'll give you the last word here. Uh, all of what you just said. <laughs> I agree with everybody. I agree with everybody. That's my last word. All right. Well, I'm up next. And this is a, a story that I've been really fascinated by. Um, so my story um, is about mini brains grown in a lab that develop their own, and I'll put this in air quotes, eyes. <laughs> uh, and so one thing that we start out with is the idea of what scientists called organoids. And organoids are essentially tissue cultures that are grown in you know, dishes in the lab. But instead of just being a flat layer of cells, which is what scientists studied for a long time, um, there are actually three dimensional structures that can better mimic the way that real organs work. Um, and so these are now being used um, for, to study many different types of organs. Um, but the one that, in, you know, that was featured in this particular study was actually an organoid that was grown from brain cells. And so what was really interesting about this particular study is that scientists had previously grown, you know, brain cells into organoids before, and they had previously grown like eye cells from the retina into, you know, retinal organoids before. But this was the first time that they started with brain cells 
and watched those mini brains develop these eye structures on their own. And that in itself is kind of a really cool technical feat that this idea that, you know, that you can, you can develop these organs in a lab and they become, you know, as complex as having these additional structures um, that, that, that are functional. Um, and so what, what was really cool about the way that this developed is that, you know, these mini brains starting from just um, brain cells grew their own sort of early eye structures, which are called optic cups. Um, these optic cups in real development eventually grow into the retina, which is the light sensitive part of our eye. And what these scientists found was that these, again, optic cups grown in a dish were actually light sensitive. Um, they had electrical activity that was responsive to light. Um, they differentiated into dif the different types of cell types that you might find in your eye. Um, and they actually connected to other parts of the brain. So, you know, this is a whole le new level of sophistication in organoids that we've never seen before. So just to make sure I understand this correctly. <laughs> There's a lot okay. going on here. I'm with you, Daryl. <laughs> so this was a this was a purposeful design study or serendipitous? Purposeful, yeah. To so, create to create these optic cups. Yeah. Use, cups using brain cells. Yes. That I then want to they that they later discovered are actually light sensitive. Right. I would like to yep. piggyback that question, Daryl, <laughs> and maybe I'm co-opting it. How did the, first off, sidebar, are, when you say brain cells, are we talking about stem cells, brain stem cells here? So these are stem cells that were originally derived maybe from um, skin cells or blood cells, um, but they're basically reprogrammed to become early brain cells. Okay, so this was exactly my question. How do yep. we program the cells such that they have the, the DNA, the instructions to grow eye cups? Yeah, that's a really great question. And you know, basically every cell in our body contains the same DNA, it contains the instructions for becoming ev you know, any kind of cell. Um, but if you catch them early enough in their development, or if you chemically, you know, reprogram them, you can essentially reverse engineer them. So something that used to be a skin cell, you can kind of take away the instructions from becoming a skin cell and then reprogram it to become any other kind of, you know, any kind an other kind of cell in your body. Okay, and not to be too sci-fi about it, but... Can they also limit the instructions so that it just stops at the eye cup right. and doesn't then develop legs? Oh, this is a qu good question. <laughs> so they didn't go that far. <laughs> but there's actually, I think, a second part of Rachel's question, Derek, that 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 that'll lead me to to yours as well. Because what they did was they started out with just so every mini mini brain started from ten thousand of these early brain cells. And all they did was add a chemical that's related to vitamin A. Vitamin A is important for eye development and just let them go. And this is, the, this is the cool thing is that they developed, like they timed when they gave, um, you know, this, this chemical to, to the, to the applied it to the brains um, so that it roughly mirrored the timing of when eye development starts happening. And so these cells, you know, were able to just oh. be cued by this, you know, by this vitamin A related chemical to grow these eye structures on their own. And so that does raise a really interesting question about like, what happens if you let it go even further, <laughs> right? In this case, you know, they, they, they studied the cells at 30 days and 60 days to analyze what was going on. Um, but neuroscientists and ethicists are really interested in thinking about this kind of question is like, what happens now that we know that, you know, these kinds of structures can develop on their own? And what does that mean in terms of how we work with them? So I should say that the, the, the reason that, that, you know, we're not just doing this for the, you know, for kicks here, right? <laughs> there are a couple of really good reasons why we're doing this. Um, so, 
being able to study these three-dimensional um, organoids gives us a better understanding of the complexity of the human body so we can better understand um, diseases and development. Um, and there's even an idea that if you can grow these in a dish, we can be we can customize how we treat individual patients by, you know, growing, you know, if, you know, you know, Rachel's got, you know, a, a disease that we want to treat. Well, let's take some of Rachel's cells and grow Rachel's personal organoid here. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. And as, a, as another, uh, so these happen to be brain cells that were, you know, the, the, uh, the precursors for the creation of these it, it, stem cells, as we know, have the ability to um, take on or pursue a lot of different uh, development yeah. pathways, right? So this could be, and were they were these brain cells of a particular um, mammalian cell type, or so these were grown from um, human stem. Uh, these were these cells. are human. Okay. Um, and they applied this at, uh, and it's, there's a question here about how long does it take to grow. So. Um, some of the milestones that they looked at was at 30 days after they started growing the dishes, you start to see these early eye formations. And at 60 days, they were able to see these op, you know, functional optic cups. Um, so it's, it's pretty quick. Are they blue like, eye cups or brown eye cups? <laughs> <laughs> let's not even get into the genetics of eye color. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think an, an interesting question that, that comes from these experiments is like, you know, when we think about the ethics of working with, mm. you know, with neuroscience and, and humans and brains, like what is like that gets into questions of consciousness, right? And, and these are questions that, you know, we're starting to work with um, scientists about because there aren't any great scientific definitions of what that means. And obviously it depends on, you know, our values as, as a culture and as a society. Um, so, I, you know, there's gonna be some really interesting work being done as, you know, as this science progresses to start figuring out, well, where are those boundaries that maybe we're not so comfortable with? Hmm. Mm. So I'm uncomfortable talking about. <laughs> <laughs> no, right, last, last thoughts, yeah. from Rachel. Go ahead. Well, no, I just it's it's wiggy to think about, right? And you know, for lack of a better phrase, it's blowing my mind. <laughs> mm -hmm. I see what you did there. <laughs> uh, but no, but this question that you ended on, I think, is is something that I was thinking about is is where that where that limit is, and and what combination of these organoids is required to to reach consciousness, and and even once a being, whatever that being may be, um, has consciousness, if they cannot articulate it, how do we know? <laughs> and so these, these ideas of sort of, um, you know, in a more quantitative and a firm manner, trying to per make parameters around what it means to be conscious, I think is a, is a pretty, um, it's, it's, it's wacky. It's hard. It's hard to wrap your head around, I think. Um, and so I'll be excited to pick your brain more um, on this exact topic. <laughs> wow, you're, re uh, you're really just here. I have to. <laughs> <laughs> to get Joe, a sense of where folks are heading with this space. Yeah. Well, Joe, yeah, what are your takeaways? I think about even going further and getting even more sci fi and think about like the human technology interface, right? And like how you could take this and pair this with other technologies where, you know, you could create some, um, um, I'll just, you know, use robotics as an example, where you could, you know, create consciousness uh, or, or, or the likes uh, by that human technology, the, the interface of human technology. So, yeah, there's a lot of different directions this could go. And I think those ethics questions continue to just sort of pile up as, you know, just because we can doesn't mean we should kind of thing, you know? Mm. Eric, what's, what's your word on this? So, yeah, I'm all about these ethical questions, too. I mean, that's really the reason why I asked about the brown eyes, blue eyes thing is because of the humanity, humanity part in this. But uh, at the same time, being the space guy, I'm also wondering, what are the implications for long duration space flight? Is there some mechanism way down the pike in the future in which these kinds of technologies might be applicable to allow humanity to, to uh, expand out into space? Yeah, and even more near term, like, you know, these are really a lot more convenient to study in space to, to understand the effects of. Yeah, yeah. 
Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that crosses that off the list. Rachel, you are up last here. Sure. What you got? So I wanted to, you know, bring a story to all of you and our audience today that's been kicking around in the climate change uh, news space. If anybody out there is plugged into climate news, you'll have heard of something called the orca plant. So orca like orca whale, but actually comes from the Icelandic term energy. And the orca plant is exactly that. It's an energy um, related plant. But what it's doing is it's sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And this is an exciting technology and an application uh, potentially of a technology that we would hope will scale up or grow in the future uh, to do what's called direct air capture or DAC or DAC. Um, DAC is a type of carbon capture technology that many scientists and most of the leading global climate models suggest will need to have available to us uh, to keep global warming to a limited amount in the future. Now, how much do we want to limit global warming to? Well, right now, scientists' most optimistic and aggressive goal is 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial temperatures. So that's what we're shooting for. That's what's been agreed to in what's called the Paris Agreement. You may have heard that term kicking around. So 1.5 C, we want to limit it to, that's the Paris Agreement. And some of the challenges that came out when the Paris Agreement was first made more than five, almost 10 years ago, um, was that we didn't yet have the technology, DAC or other carbon capture technologies available to us that would help us get to 1.5 see there's a couple what are called pathways so these are basically different roads we could take different maps we could follow uh, to limit global carbon dioxide emissions and almost all of those feasible roadmaps include this direct air capture technology so it's very important very very critical that the global community figures out how to not only reduce carbon emissions into the atmosphere but pull out historical existing carbon dioxide emissions that exist in the atmosphere. So we saw just last week the first such plant um, be installed in Iceland, and they're promising to take about 4,000 tons of CO2 out of the atmosphere annually, which is um, pretty tiny. So <laughs> it's exciting. So I want to say I have tentative excitement around this. It is very exciting, but as Nature Magazine um, put it so succinctly, I think it's like trying to empty the ocean with a teaspoon. 4,000 tons sounds like a lot, but really we need to be scaling that up to billions of tons of CO2 annually if we really want to meet that Paris uh, agreement limit of 1.5 degrees Celsius warming. So how, how does it actually work? <laughs> <laughs> right, I totally skipped that in my excitement. <laughs> well, essentially direct air capture, as the name sort of implies, is capturing or sequestering or pulling down carbon dioxide directly out of the atmosphere and basically putting it into the ground. Now, the orca plant that was um, just got up and running in Iceland last week um, is pairing its storage technology with a geothermal power unit. So this is really, really neat combination of technology, but Let's break it down. Direct air capture, what happens? It, well, they basically look like gargantuan air conditioning units. And what they're doing is they're filtering air through these large fans. So you flick on these fans, they pull air through these gigantic filters and the filters essentially capture carbon dioxide. Eventually the filters fill up, we turn the fan off and we take those filters and we expose them to really high heat. By exposing them to really high heat, the carbon dioxide is able to lift off of those filters again we can capture it as a gas and then we can pump it underground using that existing pumping technology that the geothermal unit um, already has installed. Once underground, it's, it's mixed with water and it actually um, interacts with a type of rock called basalt and underground it becomes a rock, it mineralizes or it crystallizes. So it goes from being sort of a free floating gas in the atmosphere to a solid that's stored underground, i.e it can no longer create those warming um, effects that we see when it's free in the atmosphere. So are you so are some of the conditions needed to um, make this technology viable in other places is that that geothermal um, component is that a, a key. Yeah, Daryl, that's a really keen question and it's kind of you know hyper techy uh, at the moment, but yes, we will want to what's called co locate these types of direct air capture plants with 
with potentially geothermal units, but basically when we co-locate them, we want two things. We want to be able to put that CO2 underground and store it either as a solid um, or as a gas. That's another type of direct air capture technology we might be able to use is just get that CO2 out of the atmosphere and stick it underground. It doesn't matter if it turns into a mineral or not. Um, so we're going to want to make sure that we have those technologies to pump underground. But we also want to make sure that we have the electricity to run the fans. So you can imagine that turning on these gargantuan fans and just letting them run, it takes a huge amount of energy. And right now, the orca plant is a good example of that. The atmosphere is only about 0.04% CO2. So we have to filter a whole bunch of air just to get a little bit of CO2 out of it. And so right now, these units are really, really inefficient and they're really expensive. So by co-locating with the geothermal plant, you get free, clean electricity that the geothermal unit uh, is creating to switch on your fans with. And then you've also got that technology available to you to help pump it underground. If we're looking at the US, then like, you know, we're looking at Yellowstone, not Philly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't know if we'll be pumping down into Yellowstone. There's other concerns there with what's under the ground in Yellowstone. <laughs> but no, probably, that's a great question, JD. We're looking probably at areas that have already been, um, you can, developed uh, using oil and gas technologies. And that's because some of these drilling um, industrial components already exist in these areas mm. um, and so we probably want to be in an area that has good geology for this and so you probably want something that's called a cap rock which is a, a rock that basically creates a space underground where if we do pump gas down there that gas can't escape back out and so that's going to be some of the challenges right now um, that these uh, this industry is going to need to to grapple with so Rachel, I see a question here that uh, yeah. coming from our audience that actually follows my same line of thinking. You mentioned the analogy of this is like using a teaspoon to empty the ocean. So, you know, the question is how feasible is it to scale this technology up to capture billions of tons per year? And I would add on to that, is this just a, a technology just to get us started in this direction and we have to do like a whole you know, change of state of mind to get to another technology that will do this kind of work on a massive scale. Right. Yeah, that's a fabulous um, audience question there. Thanks, Derek, for relaying it. Let's put that a little bit more into context. And I wrote these factoids down because I think that they really help us grapple with how small an amount um, of CO2 is actually being removed from the atmosphere. So uh, when we compare those 4,000 tons of CO2 removed annually from the atmosphere, well, last year globally, we emitted 31.5 billion tons as a global community of CO2. Okay, so we're talking about 0.00001%. That's four zeros there. 0.00001% um, of that annual CO2. That's about as much carbon dioxide as is emitted globally in four seconds. So. Again, to use that phrase that I picked up from the Nature Magazine, it's like trying to empty the ocean with a teaspoon. So it's a little amount now, but, but as the audience member um, alluded to and Derek, you as well, this is an opportunity to show that the technology can work. So that's a really, really big step. So a lot of us in the climate community are anxious, really, really anxious to, to scale this up. It doesn't matter how much it costs. Let's do it now, do it now. But of course we need industry and tech to catch up um, with those desires there. So fortunately, we need to be um, a little bit patient when it comes to demonstrating that the technology works and then being able to implement it uh, globally. I think that we do have good reason to be positive um, because these are conversations that are uh, gaining some traction um, in the political realm um, to help throw some funding at direct air capture, air capture uh, development. I'm so glad you gave us that a little bit of like a glass half full perspective. <laughs> Yeah. I don't and often I, get that opportunity when I'm talking about climate change, JD. And I really like this audience uh, statement slash question about, you know, um, the technology and the allowances uh, yep. versus, you know, making concerted efforts to try to uh, turn things around from, from um, carbon production in the first place. I, uh, I'm curious what others think about about that, because I do think these things have to happen simultaneously, right? We can't just say, well, oh, we'll just continue to pollute the earth and we'll just 
you know, create these technologies to, to, to try to mm -hmm. mitigate things. I think we need a shift in uh, values and uh, a shift in, in behaviors. Well, let's Definitely. get everybody's last take, you know, on that, on that note, you know, how do we, how do we see this as a, you know, in, in the balance of everything that we need to do to combat climate change? Derek? Any little thing we can do to jumpstart this process to get to raise awareness around the world of the importance that everybody has to buy into this, I think is extraordinarily important. So as we, as we get people aware of this, hopefully the technologies will continue to show up that we need to try to mitigate this. Daryl, what's your takeaway? I already said my takeaway. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know that was your, I didn't know that was your, that was your, that was your takeaway. <laughs> yeah, I will, I'll just, I'll restate yeah. that I think it, it's, it's still, you know, these things have to happen simultaneously and it's really about a shift in values and a shift in behaviors. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, you know, we come kind of full circle back to some of the same questions that we were talking about with the internet from space and the satellites, right? Like what is what is a menu of options that we have at our disposal? And how do we, you know, I think, you know, certainly like the storms, the fires, the droughts that we're seeing have really raised the urgency of this issue. And how do we really, you know, just fire on all cylinders at all levels and what's it gonna take to get there? Yeah, JD, I, I love that point. And I guess I'll end on and, you know, I'll think we've got a couple really sharp audience members. Yes, this is a, a celebratory moment, um, but let's keep our eye on the ball here. We can't let it distract us from more, much more. First and foremost, we need to be keeping carbon in the ground in the first place. And to contextualize that, a recent study in Nature suggested that we need to be keeping at least 90% of identified coal reserves in the ground and somewhere around 50 to 60% of identified oil and gas reserves. So in the first place, we need to be reducing the amount of CO2 that we're emitting globally. Should we advance direct air capture technologies? Absolutely. And Derek, to circle back to, to your first hot take, it's a yes and approach in my mind. Um, we need to be looking at the full menu here. And you know what I'll, I'll end on here um, is that we need to be activating what we can do in the immediate future. And that is leveraging our voices. I always say when people ask what's the most important thing we can do about climate change, make sure you're talking about it, make sure you're voting on it right now, especially voting is an especially powerful tool that we have in our toolkit in the United States to move our elected officials towards supporting technologies like direct air capture and also 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 taking funds away from supporting some of those existing polluting technologies because these are going to need to go hand in hand if we want to have any any realistic opportunity to limit global warming to something that's going to be livable for the vast majority of humanity. I think that's such a great point in thinking about, you know, where, where do we as individuals have the power to make change? So that wraps us up for today. I had a great time. <laughs> this is really fun. I hope all of you did too. Thank you for your questions. Um, we'll be back next month with a whole new round of stories. Um, if you see things in the news um, that you read that spark your curiosity, send them our way. We'd love to hear what's on your mind um, and talk about those. Um, and we look forward to joining you again next month. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Come on. Yeah. Bye-bye.